the main organizer. So, uh, is going to tell us about light con gauge in covariance and field theory. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I think I'm a little bit too loud. Can you turn down the volume? No. Okay. Um, so, uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, what happens if you fix light cone gauge in covariance string field theory. So uh, let's first uh, review uh, some things. So there's light cone string field theory, which was invented uh, back in the 70s by Stanley Mandelstam and Kaku and Kikawa. And uh, the string field there is uh, is just uh, an element of uh, vector space of transverse free bosons that uh, also depends on some coordinates on the uh, on the x plus and x minus direction. So another way to say it is that the string field is just given by acting transverse uh, matter oscillators on a state with some momentum, OK? So that's the string field. Uh, the theory has no gauge invariance, and the interactions are characterized by Mandelstam diagrams, which, which look like this. So that's the light cone gauge string field theory. And uh, there's covariant string field theory, which was invented by many people, Witten and Martin Zwiebach. Uh, starting in the late 80s. Uh, so there, the string field is an element of the vector space of the full uh, CFT, including matter and ghosts. And the CFT has vanishing central charge. And uh, the, the uh, theory has a gauge symmetry, which is given by the BRST operator. And uh, the interactions in the theory are uh, can be ver quite variable, but uh, the standard choice of covariant interactions are defined by uh, the Witten vertex, where, for example, the four-point amplitude looks like this. These are our four string states, and they interact by joining through their halves, and this is our propagator. So you can compare that picture to uh, four-point amplitude in uh, light cone string field theory, which looks like this. Um, so the elementary question is, uh, how are these string field theories related? And the rough answer is basically what you would expect, which is that the light cone string field theory is just a covariant string field theory that has been fixed to light cone gauge. So what is less obvious is what the light cone gauge condition turns out to be. So it turns out to be requiring that this complicated operator here annihilates uh, the covariant string field. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, there's this cut, and then there's this little point, which is the interaction point, so to speak, on the Mandelstam diagram. So uh, let's say uh, 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 I'm not totally sure what your question is, but uh, OK, this. Yeah, so it's a, it's a surface that's given by this polygon, which has a slit and then comes here and then turns around and goes back. Uh, yes. No, no, so these no. strings are coming and then they touch at their endpoint at that dot and then they join into a big, one big string and then they split apart somewhere else and turn into two. So that's that's kind of a very physical picture of string interactions. What? 
Uh, yeah, the, now, okay, I forgot to mention in this talk, I'm always going to be talking about open strings because uh, closed strings are the same. And somehow the moduli space is easier to draw for the open string. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, oh, so Ted, can you go back or forward to the gauge fixing condition? Uh -huh. uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, how is this inverse of the Lex plus uh, or the finite? One? Uh, so, it's a little bit tricky, but basically, you define it as a uh, geometric series. So, del x is basically uh, p minus plus an oscillator part. Okay. And then you, because we're in light cone gauge, p minus is not zero, so you can make a geometric series of this nature. So it's p, p plus, right? Probably it is del yeah, plus. Yeah. Well, yeah. For me, momenta always are always ah, okay, lower okay, indices, okay, okay, so okay, okay, that okay. it's the p. So the x plus has the p minus. Okay. <laughs> yes. So it, it, it's a series in inverse powers of p minus. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. And uh, so that's what the gauge condition turns out to be. <laughs> Sorry, uh, can I ask? Uh, is there some relation or in, uh, of this condition or interplay with uh, Ziegel gauge? Well, there are different gauge conditions. This one is the generalization of light cone gauge and yang mills and uh sequel gauge is like a generalization of lorentz gauge or something so this condition will require in particular if you apply this condition at the free to the free open string it will require that the minus component of the gauge field is zero so a minus is zero whereas if you impose sequel gauge it will require that uh, the divergence of a del mu a mu is zero. So this is kind of a, yeah, so it's really like light cone gauge and Yang Mills theory. But uh, you don't uh, you don't impose them simultaneously, either one or the other, or you? No, you... there's only one gauge condition. This mm -hmm. is the light cone gauge and there's no gauge symmetry left. So there's no more gauge to fix. So if we specialize to p minus equals zero, then we get Siegel gauge. Is that the, the uh, no? That's a very bad thing to do. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So we shouldn't do that. Uh, oh, shouldn't. If we specialize to p minus equals zero, this operator I'm trying is to is it like it's some sub defined. closed subsector with of the theory with so p minus equals zero? I think the I think that's just not a well-defined limit of this operator. Like I was saying to Carlo, to define the inverse of del x plus, you have to make this geometric series expansion in the oscillator part of del x. And that expansion is not, cannot be done if, if the, if the uh, p minus is zero. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know if this, there's a well-defined limit uh, of this operator. But probably you get Siegel gauge and p minus going to infinity. Uh, if, no, if I you... think you might actually get zero or something. The B zero will c cancel with the other operator, but no, I'm not sure. No, I'm not totally sure. Okay. Because there will be a bunch of uh, one over P minus to some power. So you, I don't know. Yeah, if so there's a P power. minus down here and a P minus up there. Oh, yeah, okay, and there's yeah. a one over Xi, which turns into a Xi. And then you could see that p minus goes to infinity. This will be basically b naught. So the question is the relative sign, which uh -huh. I think is probably negative. Yeah. So it, it will just be saying that uh, zero times psi equals zero. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so it will cancel the, the initial b naught. I say. think so, right. but actually I haven't thought okay. about it. But I uh -huh. think it will, okay. yes. Okay. So if you expand uh, the, this formal inverse and b and b, so, so you have uh, all bo both positive and negative modes of the big O's and al alpha oscillators involved in the gauge fixing? Um, yes, but the operator commutes with L0. So it's uh, so if you have negative, negative B modes, that has to be accompanied by a positive alpha plus mode. Okay. So... Yeah, so it commutes with L0, this operator. So is there a nice uh, way of writing it uh, using oscillators? Uh, 
Well, uh, sure. I don't. It depends what you mean by nice, but uh, uh, so, so it, it would be like quadratic, or would would be a finite order. It would be non-polynomial in alpha plus oscillators. Oh, I see. So I would guess you would say it's not nice, <laughs> maybe, uh, but uh, right because you have the geometric series expansion, and so every. So so th this uh, this is uh, true for the interacting theory that it is uh, the gauge fixed yeah this also this is the gauge fixing condition that we want to impose on the interacting theory so and I'm the confused. claim this is light cone gauge i'm confused because in the uh, light cone you have just one point which you have to glue to another point and in witten's theory you glue half a string to half a string so how would that work well that that's part of what this talk is about so how to, what happens when you take the Witten theory, you impose this condition, what happens to the interactions? You know, they look very different, right? So what ha what happens here? So uh, that's part of the question. And I just, uh, just um, so this, uh, globally, this B over del X plus, is, is it a conformal primary weight one, uh, as you would naively expect? Yeah, so that second operator there is conformally invariant. Okay, okay. So this looks the same in every conformal frame, this line in Yeah, so this operator okay. is the same in every conformal frame, and that okay. will be important later. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of weird, but <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, okay, so this is how light cone gauge works. Okay, so the covariant string field can be de decomposed into transverse and longitudinal parts. Okay, so there's a transverse part of the string field and a longitudinal part. Uh, I will give more details later, but uh, um, so the transverse part turns out to be uh, isomorphic to the standard light cone string field, okay? And the longitudinal part, uh, it turns out that if you impose this gauge condition, its equations of motion are purely algebraic. So you can integrate out this longitudinal part of the string field. And uh, the result is an action which depends only on the light cone string field, okay? And therefore you can call it a light cone string field theory. So that's the sense in which fixing light cone gauge results in a light cone string field theory, okay? However, light cone string field theory, as we conventionally understand it, is characterized not only by the light cone string field, but by the fact that interactions take place through Mandelstam diagrams, this, uh, this picture we had before. So these kind of diagrams are how we understand light cone interactions. But it's far from clear that after fixing light cone gauge and integrating out the longitudinal states, that we will have some light cone action which has an interpretation in terms of Mandelstam diagrams. Okay, but uh, what, what, what has been shown is that uh, the conventional, uh, the original light cone string field theory of Kaku and Kikawa um, indeed arises by fixing light cone gauge in a covariant string field theory which called the Kugo-Zwiebach string field theory. So if we fix light cone gauge in the Kugo-Zwiebach theory, we end up with the conventional light cone string field theory, um, where the Kugo-Zwiebach string field theory is a covariant string field theory whose interactions are defined by light cone vertices, okay? So what this shows is that the light cone, uh, the vertices of light cone string field theory are preserved through the process of fixing light cone gauge and integrating out the longitudinal states. So this is a, uh, this is a remarkable fact, which uh, we refer to as uh, transfer invariance. So in some sense, the process of homotopy transfer preserves the A infinity structure for those who, uh, to uh, know what that means. Okay. Okay, but the kugel zwiebach string field theory uh, is not really quite what one thinks about when you think about covariant string field theory because 
it has light cone style interactions and light cone interactions are not covariant, okay? So, uh, um, and moreover, maybe it's not surprising that uh, you would get a light cone string field theory with the conventional light cone interactions if you start with the covariant theory, which also has those interactions. So the real question we wanna ask is uh, what kind of light cone string field theory results from fixing light cone gauge in a typical uh, covariant string field theory? Okay, so this is the question we want to address in this talk. Uh, are, are there any other questions? Okay, so we want to see what happens when we impose light cone gauge. So let's start with what happens to the cubic vertex because this story is known. Um, so if you start with a uh, cubic, the general cubic vertex and some covariant string field theory, it's defined by a correlation function on the unit disk with certain uh, local coordinate patches defined by local coordinate maps. And if you fix light cone gauge, it turns out that this covariant vertex reduces to a vertex uh, which is given by a Mandelstam diagram, okay? So it's, it's, it reduces to the cubic vertex of the light cone theory attached to stubs of varying length. In this case, L, A, L, B, L, C, okay? These little things are called stubs, these strips of string which are attached to that vertex. Um, so it's quite remarkable that uh, regardless of the geometry that of the uh, cubic vertex that you start with, once you fix, fix light cone gauge, the Mandelstam diagram appears. Okay. And in this process, the only information about the covariant vertex which survives after fixing light cone gauge is the is the local dilatation at the punctures, okay? So there are certain stubs which are attached to this uh, light cone vertex and their lengths must be adjusted so as to ensure that the local dilatation at the punctures is the same both before and after fixing light cone gauge, okay? So, these, so that's how these stub lengths are determined. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, the uh, stub lengths are chosen in such a way that uh, if you're computing a coupling between primary states, it's the same both before and after you fix light cone gauge. Okay. But this raises kind of a strange difficulty, okay? If one of our strings in the cubic vertex is a soft, that soft, that is, if it has very small minus momentum, uh, it's uh, when it when it interacts through the cubic vertex, its strip is very thin. Okay, and what this means is that uh, this soft string will have a very uh, 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 will will come with a dilatation factor that is very small, okay? But typically the dilatation factor that's defined by the covariant vertex is fixed, independent of the momenta. So that means that uh, when we fix light cone gauge, the, the length of the strip, which is attached to the vertex, will eventually need to become negative uh, to compensate for the uh, the extremely small scale scale transformation uh, associated to the soft string state. Uh, well, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, so we now, yes, right. So a typical vertex will have a, uh, you know, we'll have some constant scale scale at the uh, at the puncture. Okay, the Mandelstam map 
has a scale which depends on the momenta. And as one of the momenta goes to zero relative to the others, the scale factor shrinks to zero. Okay. But then these, uh, but then these, this stub length has to decrease its length to compensate. And eventually the stub length has to become negative. And in some sense, the, uh, the strip has to eat the, the cubic vertex, okay? <laughs> has to somehow, you have some negative world sheet which destroys the positive world sheet. And if you look at what this means concretely, it turns out that the vertex is not normalizable. Okay, that, so it actually defines uh, um, couplings which grow exponentially with the mass level. That's what it means concretely. Okay. So that means that light cone gauge in covariant string field theory is generically singular. Okay. Uh, this is called, called this the soft string problem of light cone gauge. Um, and it's, it's, uh, okay, it's really, uh, it's, uh, okay. <laughs> It's uh, uh, this problem is is gives some some obstacle to giving a very precise understanding of the correspondence between uh, covariant and light cone string field theories. But uh, for now, we we will just ex you know accept it as a fact of life, and we will discuss uh, this problem of fixing light cone gauge, assuming that we're interested in amplitudes in the kinematic region where uh, this uh, soft string problem does not appear. Is it possible to make the length of the subs in the covariance side a change with the momentum? Yes, but then it wouldn't, yes, but the, and then you would solve that problem if you somehow put stubs on the covariant vertex that change their length so so as to uh, somehow cancel then then this problem wouldn't appear but the okay but in covariant string field theory vertices are usually uh, universal they're defined by geometrical data which is independent of the state which the states which appear in the vertex so that is not true of the light cone theory so in the light cone theory the shape of the vertex depends on the uh, minus on the length of the strings, which in turn depends on the minus moment of the states. So um, if you try to compensate with the, in the uh, covariant vertex, then uh, the vertex will not be a covariant covariant anymore. It'll be like kind of like the Kugo-Zwiebach theory where um, Thank you. Um, and conversely, could you modify the Lycon string theory to take care of this? And probably would be then no longer cubic, but would that be possible? You know, do you well, modify this the Lycon? This is kind of what I was hoping to find out that uh, whether by fixing Lycon gauge, you can find anything different from the standard story. Okay, so, okay, so, so far, okay, the upshot is that the only thing you find different from the standard light cone theory, uh, that is like uh, Kaku and Kikawa's light cone string field theory, is that in general you can have light cone vertices with stubs. And this is generally what happens when you fix a uh, light cone gauge in covariant string field theory. Um, yeah, so this, uh, okay. So this is what happens with the cubic vertex. And uh, the next question is, okay, so what happens with the higher vertices? And this turns out to be uh, a really, uh, a really uh, difficult problem, uh, or <laughs> somehow a complicated problem. Uh, but uh, I will just try to, uh, in the following, I'll just try to give you a sketch of what happens, like the important ideas and not get too much into the details of how this works, but uh, um, but uh, okay. So so that's the question: What happens with the higher vertices? Okay. Um, 
Are there any questions at this point? Any more questions? Okay, so let me get, get into a, a little bit more detail about the light cone gauge condition. So we introduce uh, two important operators. Uh, okay. Yeah, so there's this, uh, um, what I'm called the, the DDF B ghost and the uh, DDF uh, dilatation generator, okay? And they're given by these formulas. So the B DDF B ghost, uh, you recognize that from the light cone gauge condition, which was written earlier. And this DDF dilatation generator is just the BRST variation of the B DDF B ghost. So these are two important operators for defining the light cone gauge condition. Um, and it's important to note that both of these operators are conformally invariant. That is, they're given by charges of weight one primaries, okay? With the understanding that the B ghost is a primary operator of weight two, and one over del X is a primary operator of weight minus one. So this thing is an operator of weight one in total, so it's conformally invariant. The same is true if you look at this thing this Schwartzian derivative correction that this thing is also a uh, primary, okay? So um, this operator LDDF, the DDF dilatation generator, um, is a level counting operator, okay? But it counts the level created by uh, transverse excitations of the string field. That is, string uh, excitations that are created through DDF operators, okay? Okay, so, um, so the light cone gauge condition written in this way is just B0 minus BDDF equals zero, okay? That's what we wrote before. So if, uh, um, if L0 is the same as the DDF dilatation generator, then we know that all excitations in our string field are transverse excitations. Furthermore, if L0 is greater than the DDF counting operator, that means that some excitations in the string field come from unphysical ghost oscillators or light cone oscillators. So that means that we can decompose the string field into a transverse part and a longitudinal part characterized according to whether L0 is the same as LDDF or whether L0 is greater than LDDF, okay? And this decomposition looks like this, where now this psi light cone is our light cone string field. And there's an operator that acts on the light cone string field. This is called the, uh, the uh, Isaka-Kazama transformation. And what it does for our purposes, all we need to know about this operator S, it's a similarity transformation, is that it turns the conventional transverse oscillators of the string and light cone gauge into DDF operators. So you commute this S through the alpha I oscillator, you get the DDF operator, uh, you get the DDF operator, which looks like that. Okay, in addition to a zero mode prefactor. And again, the thing that one should note, note about this DDF operator is that it's conformally invariant. So it's uh, because this X, so you have some e to the X plus prefactor. It's X plus, this prefactor is basically a primary of dimension zero. So this del, so, and this del X is a primary of dimension one. So this whole integrand is a, is a primary of dimension one. And this is a zero mode of a primary of dimension one, which means the DDF operator is conformally invariant. And that's also going to be important. Okay. So the propagator and light cone gauge uh, breaks up into transverse and longitudinal parts. So the transverse part is just the Siegel gauge propagator multiplied by this operator, which is just the projection 
on the states where L0 is equal to LDDF. So this is in fact just the projector onto transverse states. And the second, there's a second term in the propagator, which is called the longitudinal propagator. And the thing to note about this longitudinal propagator is that uh, it has no poles in the momenta. So all the states which are propagating through this propagator are auxiliary, they're, they're not dynamical, so they can be integrated out. Any questions? Okay. So if the original covariant string field theory action is this, you have the usual BRC kinetic term and then some string products defining the higher vertices, the light cone gauge fixed action will look like this, where instead of the full covariant string field, we have our light cone string field. Uh, we don't have the BRST operator, but we have C0, L0. And then we have a bunch of string products, okay, which have been transformed by the light cone gauge condition, okay? So these products, it turns out, are given by Feynman graph expansion where the vertices are those of the original theory and the propagators are the internal lines represent uh, longitudinal propagators. In the original Kaku Kikawa, there is only a quartic vertex. Uh -huh. you, had a, you have a plus dot, dot, dot. Yeah, so this is uh, this is a generic uh, covariant string field theory we have here, um, and this theory yes, but uh, could, I was referring to the light code, the Witten theory, but uh, it will be uh, in general non-polynomial. It could be non-polynomial, and the resulting gauge fixed action is will also in general be non-polynomial. Because uh, in all the light cone one, <laughs> well, yeah. So uh, Kaku and Kikawa's theory is quartic. Yes, I, at least at the bosonic level. <laughs> right, but uh, this will not happen if you fix light cone gauge in a gener generic covariant string field theory. So what we're trying to figure out is what do, what are all these higher vertices and what are they doing? Okay, so. So here is, for example, the, uh, the quintic vertex. You will have uh, a contribution from the quintic vertex of your covariant theory with transverse external states. And then you will have a contribution from a term containing one longitudinal propagator with a, with a uh, cubic and quartic vertex and uh, and, and terms containing two longitudinal propagators with uh, three cubic vertices, okay? So this is the general structure of the, uh, of the higher uh, interactions after you fix light cone gauge and covariant string field theory. So the question is, what are, what is all this stuff, okay? How do you compute all this stuff and what is the result of computing it? Uh, now we're just doing tree level. <laughs> okay, it's hard enough right now. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's okay, let's start with the vertices that do not contain any longitudinal propagators. So in in the case of the quintic vertex, that's just we're gonna look at this contribution to the gauge fixed action, the contribution without longitudinal propagators. Okay, so um, uh, so for this we need to uh, we need the vertex of the original covariant theory. So an endpoint vertex in the covariant theory is given by integrating some endpoint surface states over some over some portion of the moduli space of disks with n boundary punctures. Okay. Um, and these surface states are basically defined by correlation functions on the unit disks with certain local coordinates defined around each puncture, 
Okay. So, um, so the contribution of the uh, covariant vertex to the gauge fixed action is just given by evaluating this surface state uh, on a set of transverse string fields. Okay. So the question is, what is the result of evaluating this? And this is the this will give us uh, this contribution to the gauge fixed action, the one without longitudinal propagators. So um, the first point is that um, uh, since uh, since this transformation S maps the transverse oscillators into DDF operators, the local coordinate maps which define the surface state only affect the result through the pre zero mode prefactor. Okay, so after we map our light cone states with this uh, Isaka Kazama transformation, we will just be left with DDF operators with this zero mode prefactor. And this conformal transformation, which defines the surface state, will only affect this zero mode prefactor. Okay, and this contour is covariant, is uh, conformally invariant. So what we immediately learn from this is that uh, is that much of the geometrical information which defines the covariant end string vertex is lost once we fix light cone gauge. The only only information that can survive has to survive through this zero mode prefactor. So uh, so once we are looking at transverse states, uh, the nature of the uh, vertex of the original theory is forgotten. Okay. And the second point is that, um, uh, okay, concerns a certain uh, identity. So, um, so let's consider some uh, conformal field theory operator, f of x plus, which is, which, uh, is a functional of the chiral free boson X plus uh, and possibly other operators in the world sheet theory, but it's not a, uh, a functional of X minus. And it turns out that correlation functions of this operator in the presence of boundary plane wave vertex operators satisfies this identity. That is X plus of U can be replaced by this function <laughs> where rho of U is the Mandelstam mapping, okay? The Mandelstam mapping is the conformal transformation which maps the upper half plane with punctures at certain points into a Mandelstam diagram, okay? So this Mandelstam mapping is defined according with the, to the momenta of the, uh, of the, uh, vertex operators at the punctures. Uh, how am I doing with time? Okay. Um, so this identity where we are allowed to replace X plus with uh, the Mandelstam mapping is, uh, we call this the uh, replacement formula, okay? It says that in the context of this correlator, the coordinate rho on the Mandelstam diagram is proportional to the plus component of the string embedding coordinate, okay? So this is in some sense uh, a statement that in, the, that in this, in the context of this correlator, uh, the string world sheet theory is really behaving as though uh, uh, it is in light cone gauge. That is the coordinate is equal to X plus. There's no conformal map here. Uh, this rho of u is is a function, okay, which is which is the Mandelstam mapping. Uh, yeah, so it is that that is in fact what rho of u is. It's a conformal map, but it's also just a function of u, which. Uh,
No, it's not, it's not acting as a conformal transformation on anything. You've just take the functional, the operators of functional you have here. And the prescription is that if you have a correlation function like this, you can just replace X plus with rho. Which picture, this one? Oh, this picture is just defining what a Mandel stem map does. There's a map of the upper half plane. So perhaps it's misleading, but m some people may not have uh, seen the Mandel stem mapping before. So, um, but this is not what this is not what this is doing. Uh, this is not map. There's this relation is not mapping some. Both of, both sides of the equation are correlation functions on the upper half plane. It's just what it's saying is that x plus this operator x plus is equal to some point on the Mandelstam diagram, okay? Which is really just saying that, uh, that uh, this point on the Mandelstam diagram is being set equal to some string coordinate, which is really what you're saying when you say that, uh, that you so fixed just, light cone gauge. Just to understand that if f of u was simply the x plus, yes. you would s get, simply get the sum of k minus divided by u, Right. When you are, or you would get del rho, right? Yes, but del rho, okay. This yes. is what you are saying. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, one could, of course, apply rho to this whole thing and get some correlation function, but that's not what we're doing. That's not what the replacement formula says. The replacement formula says that a point on the Mandelstam diagram is equal to x plus, okay? So you could think of it, you just think of it as saying that the string is in light cone gauge. So if you have a correlation function like this, then that's, uh, then this, this happens to be true, okay? Um, and this is called the replacement formula. Okay, so, um, so now, if we apply this uh, replacement formula and we look at our DDF operator, okay, our DDF operator has this e to the x plus in here inside the integrand, and we can use the replacement formula to replace this x plus with rho. And then you uh, start with this operator, which is a DDF operator, and you obtain this operator, okay, which is now just a del x, and, it's, uh, and you just have a fixed function rho of u here, okay? So remarkably, this expression here turns out to be, uh, you can derive it through a conformal transformation of the transverse oscillator. So the alpha minus ni, if you apply these conformal maps, including the inverse of the Mandelstam map, then you will get this expression. So this is uh, how, um, Okay, in the first step, we saw that because the DDF operators are conformally invariant, the geometry of the original vertex is lost. But the replacement formula is how the geometry of the Mandelstam diagram is inserted back in. So in this way, uh, we start with a covariant vertex without longitudinal propagators, and we end up with a, uh, with a Mandelstam diagram. So the precise statement is this, that if you have a surface state acting on some collection of transverse string fields, and this turns out to be equal to uh, the, the surface state of the canonical Mandelstam diagram, the canonical surface state associated with the Mandelstam diagram at the same point in moduli space as this sigma, with some stubs, okay, with some uh, dilatation generators here, dilatation operators, which attach stubs to this uh, light cone surface state. And again, these stubs, okay, they arise from the uh, conformal transformation of the zero mode prefactor, uh, which, uh, which was here. So that zero mode prefactor ends up determining the length of these stubs attached to the light cone vertex. And these lengths are uh, determined, again, by the requirement that 
the local dilatation at the punctures is the same on the left and right hand, hand side of this equation, okay? So that means that once we fix light cone gauge, uh, the covariant vertex just reduces to a vertex representing a collection of Mandelstam diagrams, which covers the same portion of moduli space as the original vertex. Any questions? Okay, Ted, I have a question. Somebody had a question? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the question is, so before you gauge fix, the different stub lengths are related by Feely definition, right, in the covariant version. After you gauge fix, is it easy to see the equivalence of these dif different stub lengths, or do you have to go back to the covariant version? Uh, well, I'm trying to figure out the question that you want to address. So you want to uh, adjust these stub lengths. In this, that's right, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, that, okay, See, that's something- the Covariant the version, they are just level level by, by changing the, uh, the local coordinate maps or by attaching stubs to your covariant vertex and that will descend down here. And then uh, there is probably some field redefinition just within the light cone theory, which can adjust these lengths, but I actually haven't thought about it. Uh, um, uh, what can be said about such a uh, field redefinition, or how to how to construct it within within the, the light cone framework exclusively? Uh, but presumably, that it's pro probably it's just the same as the covariant field redefinition, but just somehow projected with transverse states or so, something like that. <laughs> okay, um, I, see. I, I, I I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Um, but I think it should be possible. I don't see why it shouldn't be possible. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so so uh, so now we have characterized the vertex, the contribution to the vertex and light cone gauge from terms which contain no longitudinal propagators. That is terms which do not contain the propagation of longitudinal states. But the problem is that, uh, is that, uh, in looking at the coupling between transverse states, uh, uh, the, the surface state is projected down to a collection of Mandelstam diagrams, but these Mandelstam diagrams cover the same portion of moduli space as in the original covariant vertex, okay? But the problem is because the local coordinates around the punctures have been changed from those of the covariant vertex to those of the light cone vertices or to uh, Mandelstam diagrams, uh, we will no longer have a, uh, a consistent decomposition of the moduli space just defined by the covariant vertex and the, uh, and the propagator terms uh, of the action. So the, so the covariant vertex will, will, okay, so in this case, in the, this picture represents the moduli space uh, of, a, uh, of a disk with five punctures. So this moduli space is a pentagon and uh, the covariant vertex will cover some uh, pentagon shaped region inside of this. And then there will be regions that are covered by Feynman diagrams with one propagator and with two propagators. So going back uh, before, so these are the uh, diagrams with one propagator and these are the di di diagrams with two propagators. And uh, normally uh, in the covariant theory, uh, these regions would connect up to cover the whole pentagon. But now because, uh, because the light cone gauge condition has changed the, uh, the local coordinates around the punctures, we no longer are covering the moduli space. So we have some missing region in here, okay. And it turns out that it's the role of the longitudinal propagators or the the corrections from integrating out the longitudinal states, it's their role to fill in this, this, this missing blue region, okay? So uh, any questions at this point? 
This is a caricature, but uh, it's precise to some level, um, at least in topology. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. So now we have to. So now what we're hoping is that the uh, the longitudinal propagators will fill in the rest of this stuff. Okay. But uh, but dealing with the longitudinal propagators raises two questions. One is that uh, it involves integrating over strips of longitudinal uh, world sheet, okay? So we're adding longitudinal world sheet to our, to our Feynman diagrams. And the longitudinal part of the CFT has non-vanishing central charge. So in order to deal with this operator, we have to come to terms with the conformal anomaly and understanding how to evaluate partition functions on Mandelstam diagrams. The second aspect of this is that uh, it's not clear how putting in a strip of longitudinal states will actually move you in the moduli space, which normally would require a, a strip of the uh, transverse states or a, of the, a, a physical, uh, physical, uh, a physical strip. So these are the questions one has to answer, and it's not uh, not clear how how this will work. So let's uh, start with the first question. So how do we deal with uh, uh, partition functions on Mandelstam diagrams, and uh, or how do you deal with uh, uh, yeah how, how do you deal with correlation functions on Mandelstam diagrams when you have non-vanishing central charge? So, uh, so this this is actually uh, it, it's actually well known <laughs> how to deal with this among uh, pe people from a long time ago uh, who are dealing with uh, calculations in light cone string field theory, and it represents kind of one of the more technical uh, aspects of light cone string field theory that doesn't really translate in uh, covariant string field theory because we. In covariant theory, we always have vanishing central charge. And uh, there are people, there are various ways of commute, computing these uh, partition functions uh, through the conformal anomaly or through evaluating uh, uh, the determinants of Laplacians on Mandelstam diagrams and things like that. There's a whole chapter in Green, Schwartz, and Witten about this. Uh, but uh, we're going to approach it from a different point of view which is something that I call the kugold zwiebach phenomenon. So, uh, <clears throat> um, so the kugold zwiebach phenomenon was, is this uh, observation, which was given in, a, in an appendix of uh, a paper by Kugold and, and, and Zwiebach on the, where they discussed this theory that uh, this covariant theory with light cone vertices. And they observed that if you compute uh, transverse but off-shell Siegel gauge amplitudes in the kugold zwiebach theory, it's the same as computing light cone gauge amplitudes in the kugold zwiebach theory, or it's the same as computing light cone gauge amplitudes in uh, Kaku and Kikawa's uh, light cone string field theory, okay? So that means that in the kugold zwiebach theory, it does not matter whether your propagator, if you're considering transverse amplitudes, it does not matter whether your propagator is the Siegel gauge propagator or the light cone gauge propagator. Okay. This is a rather funny phenomenon because these are rather quite different operators. Okay. Um, okay. So it's uh, because due to uh, this phenomenon of transfer invariance of the light cone vertices, so this property of uh, the kugold zubach theory and light cone vertices, we already know that we can drop uh, the longitudinal propagator out of the light cone gauge propagator and it will not affect the result, okay? 
so then the question is, uh, it, the statement is that it doesn't matter whether we use the Siegel gauge propagator or the Siegel gauge propagator multiplied by the projector on this transverse states. So this suggests that, uh, that uh, Siegel gauge amplitudes in the kugold zubach theory uh, do not contain longitudinal intermediate states. That seems to be the only way that uh, inside our propagators that this operator will reduce to the identity. Okay. So, uh, so if this is the case, then we should be able to adjust uh, separately the length of the propagator strip in the longitudinal sector uh, from, the, uh, from the length of the propagator strip in the transverse sector. So if we consider like this propagator strip, e to the minus SL0, this is the length of the propagator strip, this can be written kind of factorized into a transverse propagator strip given by this uh, uh, DDF uh, dilatation generator and a longitudinal propagator strip, okay? And it suggests that we, that, uh, okay, that we can actually change this parameter S here into any other parameter S prime, and the result will be the same uh, in the kugel zubach theory, okay? So in pictures, if this is our uh, propagator strip here, the strip, the propagator strip, you could think of it as made of a, of a transverse layer and a longitudinal layer. And we can, if we keep the transverse layer fixed, we can increase the length of the longitudinal layer uh, as much as we want, okay? So, um, uh, so, what is, so what is the, okay, what is the point of this? So the point is that uh, if, we, uh, if we take the width of this longitudinal strip, that we take the length to infinity, then this operator will reduce to the projection onto longitudinal states. And since the length, since the amplitude is independent of this length, we can, uh, we can uh, in this way, uh, start with a, uh, with a, uh, diagram in the uh, in the light cone string field theory uh, where the world sheet theory has non has vanishing central charge and we can basically insert this uh, longitudinal propagator strip for free and in this way make the world sheet uh, theory have vanishing central charge and if you do this uh, it turns out that it precisely accounts for uh, the conformal anomaly factors that appear in light cone string field theory. Uh, are there any other qu any questions at this point? Okay, so the final thing is to see uh, what is happening with this longitudinal propagator. So the longitudinal propagator can be expanded uh, in terms of a Schwinger parameter S like this. So what we will do is uh, we will consider, so we have L0 minus LDDF. We will consider this L0 to generate some world sheet inside our correlation function. And this LDDF, we will just treat it separately as an operator insertion in the correlation function. So, uh, that means that if we're considering, if we're, um, if we're considering a, uh, a quartic interaction term with a long longitudinal propagator, we will have some covariant vertices and some transverse external states and some region here, which will be created by uh, our, uh, our propagator strip, our Siegel gauge propagator strip. And this region will contain this, opera this uh, operator LDDF. So this correlation function represents our, uh, uh, our 
correction to our vertex from a longitudinal propagator. And then you can use this replacement formula to replace this LDDF uh, with, the, uh, with the zero mode of the zero mode VRSRO of the uh, transverse free bosons. So it turns out that that, that works. And the local coordinate maps of, at the same time, the local coordinate maps of the, uh, of the covariant, of the, uh, of the covariant theory are replaced by uh, light cone style local coordinate maps. Okay. So, um, so in the context, in this context, it turns out that the longitudinal propagator takes this form where, uh, where we've used the replacement formula to, uh, to replace LDDF with the genuine transverse uh, uh, Virasoro generator. And we have this uh, Schrodinger parameter S is still here. Okay, but now uh, in front of L naught is, uh, is some function S light cone of S. Okay, so this S light cone should be determined such that, uh, uh, such that the length of the propagator strip uh, of the light cone gauge Feynman diagram corresponds to the same point of, in moduli space as uh, the length of the propagator strip of the uh, of the uh, <laughs> of the uh, um, covariant Feynman diagram, and so you have this uh, this expression. And then using this trick of, uh, ins of inserting a piece of longitudinal world sheet, we could turn this transverse L0 into a full L0, because we're in the context now of a uh, maybe light cone style diagram. And then, uh, and then in the end, our, our, uh, our, uh, um, longitudinal propagator reduces to this expression. So now it turns out, okay, I will not prove this, but that if you integrate this Schrodinger parameter from zero to infinity, and you look at this map between the covariant S and the light cone S, that this, uh, this propagator strip will actually cover a finite region of moduli space. And this precisely fills in, uh, this uh, this uh, this propagator region we have here, and uh, so that's that's how it works. Okay, so thank you. I have a micro. Oh. <laughs> so, so now we have this covariant. Let's just take the cubic theory of the cubic covariant theory. Uh -huh. So we have this covariant theory, which we know is a, is a good theory. And we have this Lycon theory, which we also think is a good theory. Uh -huh. But you say they're not, one is not really the gauge fixed form of the other. Uh, not quite. Isn't that what you're saying? Well, so Kaku and Kikawa's light cone string field theory is not Witten string field theory fixed to light cone gauge. That's what you're saying. Yeah, but yet, the, but are they equivalent, or can we not conclude that? Yeah. Well, they are. They should be equivalent, uh, and they're almost equivalent, except for this soft string problem I was mentioning. So that kind of there was an attempt in my paper with Hiroaki to actually construct the field redefinition which relates the Witten theory and the Kaku and Kikawa theory. But this field redefinition encountered some problems with composition. 
uh, due to uh, this soft string problem. So somehow the field redefinition turned out not to be normalizable. Uh, and uh, so that problem is still not solved. So in fact, there is no real covariant theory that, that can be fixed to light cone gauge for all momenta, okay? Sometimes for some momenta it can work, but not for all momenta. And in case the case of the Witten theory, in fact, light cone gauge doesn't work for any momenta. So it doesn't matter how big or small they are, the you always the the gauge fixed vertex you will get will always have stubs of negative length. And so the vertex will be divergent. But uh yeah, you just have to put stubs on the Witten theory and then look at a favorable amplitude where the momenta are not causing uh, negative lengths. Thank you. So you have in mind some what what should be some somehow some generic properties of the covariant theory that should somehow give you the simplest possible light cone string field theory. Well, the uh, simplest possible one is probably the. Uh, Kaku and Kikawa theory. And so the uh, the theory which gives that is is the Kugo is the Kugo, theory. Okay. Um, is there EG as a question? So I I have two questions. The first one is the uh, what is the spectrum of L naught minus L D D F? It is continuous? Uh, no, it's uh, discrete. It's discrete? Yes. Uh, but uh, you use this Shinga-like representation to implement the delta function. So mm -hmm. is this just an, uh, is it square to itself? The projection is square to itself? Or? Yeah, so maybe the delta function notation is not is misleading. Uh -huh. But I don't like the Kronecker delta because it has this like little index and the index looks a little kind of tiny. So uh -huh. I just uh, decided to write it as a delta function. <laughs> yeah, but it is squared it, itself, right? Is it just yes, a it is a projector, yes. Okay. Thank you. And the second question is, the, what is the origin of Isaka Kazama transformation? I missed it, how it appears in this story. Um, well, it is a consequence of a gauge condition. Um, in principle, you don't need this uh, transformation, but it helps you conceptualize what the transverse states are. So, so uh, if you could, if you know that the transverse states are these DDF operators, then you could just work with the DDF operators. But uh, the, uh, the Isaka Kazama transformation allows you to say that these DDF operators are isomorphic to transverse alpha oscillators. So it is kind of like a field redefinition? Yeah, yeah it's a linear field redefinition. I see. Okay. Thank you. So what is the status of the kugot Swibach theory and how is it related to Witten's theory? Well, because both of them are covariant, right? Well, the kugot Swibach theory is covariant in, it's not actually covariant, but it's a covariant string field theory in the sense that it's a gauge invariant string field theory. So it's not covariant? It's not covariant because light cone vertices are not covariant. I mean, the, the geometry of the vertex depends on these string lengths, which which are which are is equated with the minus component of the string momentum, and this minus component obviously depends. Is it a consistent and useful theory? theory? Um, it's uh, might be useful for some things, but uh, uh, probably it will only be useful for things for that don't involve. Um, vacuum structure or non-zero momentum. So in zero momentum, the the, uh, the light cone vertices become degenerate. So the theory is not, the Kugo-Zwiebach theory is somehow not very well defined at zero momentum. 
but if you're a if you have uh, non-zero momentum, then you, I think you could use the Kugel's Z-Bot theory to do calculations. Okay, I was you know wondering whether that might be a useful way to approach computation of loop amplitudes uh, in covariant string field theory using some kind of Google Zubat. Uh, uh, Relation to Witten theory is via filter definition. Uh, yeah, so, that yeah, so that was constructed. One, the natural field redefinition was constructed in my paper with uh, Hiroaki. Um, it's given by this uh, this Kaku deformation where you attach strips to Chan Payton strips to the light cone vertices and then let the strips get infinitely large. And uh, that way you can interpolate the vertices between the, uh, the light cone and the Witten vertex. And that way you can construct a field redefinition. The problem was that there's kind of a field transformation which relates the Kugold's Rebach theory to Kaku and Kikawa's theory. And there's a field redefinition which relates the Witten theory to the Kaku and Kikawa theory, or sorry, to the uh, Kugold's Rebach theory. Okay. But these two field transformations don't compose. What do you mean they don't compose? So oh, the, 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 uh, the, the domain of one is not in the image of the other. So they, they, the composition of these two transformations is singular. And this is a result of this soft string problem. Yeah, so uh, can, you, can you comment more about this zero momentum problem? Because I mean, in light con, zero momentum sector is essentially not defined, right? So, yeah. and in zero momentum, you know, there is cohomology. So, I mean, you should not really expect there to be a theory definition, right? So, this is, and perhaps these soft strings are related. Well, are related okay, yeah. This. So, yeah, yeah. So with the ca with the usual caveat that uh, that uh, there's a field redefinition with the usual caveat about zero momentum sector. sector. I I was wondering whether this this may be the origin of of, of the problems. I mean, well, you are comparing it, to theories that don't have. Like so the zero momentum problem is something that you even get in field theory, but somehow it's some it's enhanced in string theory so that, uh, yeah, so this, the momentum can be small, but non-zero. And, uh, and on so. this, I have a comment. In the, in the light cone field theory, there is a, a big discussion about uh, the issue of uh, zero moment uh, k zero k plus equal to zero, especially if you think uh, to uh, for example scalar field theory and sim uh, symmetry breaking. So it there has been uh, for quite a lot of time people saying that uh, it was necessary to add uh, an extra field in order to to, to um, keep track of the zero momentum. Uh, in order to have a symmetry breaking, but actually it doesn't seem that it is so because essentially you can reconstruct the, the symmetry breaking also starting from from a theory without the, the constant the constant uh, uh, the constant particle that is also with a field with a k plus difference from zero you can get. The symmetry, uh, the symmetry breaking of the V4. There is a, an, an article by Torn of the night of 2000. Yeah, uh, so it, I know people have, the, this is a very old problem in quantum field theory, and there are various proposed it, resolutions, like there's this discrete light cone quantization, no, but, which allows you to kind of resolve the kernel of the, kernel of the momentum better, and you could try to. But uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, if you have any theory that can describe any closed string theory that can describe the dynamics of the zero momentum sector will have to be non-polynomial. So I, I, yeah, <laughs> that seems to be the way it is. Uh, so, so somehow you can have a cubic vertex for closed strings if you have non-zero momentum, but 
you're interested in the vacuum structure, you have to deal with this non-polynomial structure. It's kind of a strange thing. Yeah, so, um, so this soft string problem is kind of somehow it's a problem of getting close to zero momentum. And it's close to zero momentum when, when measured relative to the momenta of the uh, other states that are interacting. So it's kind of a, it's kind of really a soft string, not a, yeah, it's kind of low momentum string. Rel in, in, yeah. So uh, you mentioned there is a field redefinition from uh, uh, written theory to Kugel's Viva theory by adding champ parents factors, yeah. but that only works in open string, right? It doesn't oh. seem natural for closed strings. So is it possible to like uh, find another field redefinition that will match the domains of the you know uh, take the image of the that field redefinition and that will become a domain from uh, Kugel's Viva theory to this Kagokiwa theory. Um, because I mean, every, every, you know, every, the construction that you do should in principle work in closed strings, right? Yeah. Yeah, you cannot do that, this adding champ patterns trick to to get a field definition. Yeah, but there should be an analog, I would say. Like what's the analog then? Well, I know the analog of the cubic vertex and I never bothered to try to figure out the as far as I remember, the, 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 the it, fact, uh, I mean, the, you, okay, you, you know these vertex, these vertices much better than I do, but you know, the uh, tetrahedral vertex is just, is basically a polygon, mm -hmm. and so is the, uh, uh, yeah, so, um, because well, the trihedral mm -hmm. vertex is a polygon, and so is the light cone vertex. Yeah, because and somehow I, you're interpolating between these, these. Uh, yeah, I mean, my 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 theory is more basic than that. The fact that the open strings has borders, and you are adding the strips to those borders, and taking those strips length to infinity, basically maps within light cone diagram to the Witten's diagram, right? Uh -huh. So I, if I try to do that in the like closed string field theory. You know, how do I add the champ patterns factors? Like, do I am I going to just add a like? A, I don't have borders to add those champ patterns factors. Well, you have you have lengths you have lengths of cylinders attached to your cubic vertex. Yeah, but the, yeah, you that's that's going to be lengths. different theory definition than the 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 one that you were mentioning, though, right? Yeah. So, but that that field redefinition has not been constructed. Okay, I see. Uh, I mean, you know, there's there's a natural way to do it. I kind of. Think it should be possible to construct it, and probably the I mean, construction is even natural. But mm -hmm. I haven't. Uh, I think you, you you probably are able to think. I mean, you with your work on the hyperbolic vertices, you yeah. probably. I mean, there there is a way. See, see what, what how to fit how this fits in the moduli space of all your pants diagrams that you were yeah. thinking about. I mean, I have another question about this actually. So. Um, you told that there is a like in general there is this soft string problem, right? What are the situations that there are not a soft string problem? Like uh, you've mentioned, like there are like a few like certain momentums there are none, but there. So you're claiming there is no uh, situation that it will work all, on all non-zero uh, light cone momentum. Am I correct? Yes. I see. Okay, unless your ver vertices are not covariant. I see. So your vertices would have to have stubs that adjusted their length uh, to compensate for the fact that the dilatation is shrinking to zero in the light cone vertex. Mm -hmm. So if you have a vertex that has non-zero dilatation for a string at zero momentum, which is typical in a covariant string field theory, you're going to encounter this problem at some point. I see. Thank you. Other questions? So we're also supposed to have a discussion session, right? After the coffee break. Uh, uh yeah. So I think this also could be a yeah. So people. So if there are questions to... now, that otherwise we can also have time for discussing more later. Okay. Okay. So we can thank Ted again.